our political elite did not really step up to the plate. It wasn't much of a peace process, was it? Today's Taliban are angry. But you can't lay all the blame at the US door. We, we probably didn't do a, a good job. However you spin the story of Afghanistan, and there are plenty of versions these days, the country is back where it was 20 years ago, firmly under Taliban control. But no one is quite sure what kind of regime this is, who's pulling its strings, what about its terrorist connections and its links to the narcotics trade. Is it as cruel and repressive as it used to be? My guest this week has seen the Taliban at close quarters. He's Jawad Ludin, a former advisor to ex-president Hamid Karzai and deputy foreign minister in his government. He joins me from Ottawa. What have the new rulers got in store for the Afghan people? Does the West have any effective leverage? Will anyone ever answer for the war crimes of the last 20 years? Jawed Ludin, welcome to Conflict Zone. You're welcome, thank you. Last month you told a television program you were in a state of shock about the Taliban's takeover in Kabul. I can't believe it's happened, you said. Why the shock, Mr. Lubin? Wasn't it obvious what would happen when the Americans pulled out? Uh, perhaps when the Americans pulled out, uh, but it didn't have to, even, even, even in the worst case scenario, it didn't really ha have to happen the way it did. Uh, the pull down didn't have to mean a military victory and a takeover of Kabul by, by the Taliban. It could have happened in a more responsible uh, manner. Uh, the transition could have happened in a responsible manner. And I think the Americans could have handled the, the, the peace process that they were engaged in for the, for the, for the last three years almost in, in a better way that, could have, uh, that, that this scenario could have been avoided. If you've enjoyed this interview, please share your comments below and give it a like. You might also take a look back at my interview with the last Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani. Just click on the link. It wasn't much of a peace process, was it? I mean, Donald Trump basically handed the Taliban Afghanistan over the heads of the Afghan government, didn't he? Well, I don't know how, what their intentions were. Part of the, the problem is exactly that for the last 20 years, we have been um, unclear about what the true intentions of the Americans were. Uh, for that matter, I, I use the word American, but I mean the, the, the broader Western coalition led by the United States. Um, and in this particular case, the peace process was a, was a, was a very good opportunity, in fact. They, uh, to the extent that they were talking about the U.S., uh, uh, Taliban uh, issues, which was uh, basically about the withdrawal, about the end of uh, the, the conflict, about um, um, uh, uh, some of the other uh, issues that they had. Um, it, in fact, the negotiations worked very well. It's just that uh, the U.S. too soon removed the leverage that it had on the battlefield, as well as uh, diplomatically, by 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 concluding the agreement uh, in a way that, uh, that basically gave Taliban all the all, all all the power, all the leverage, and then made the peace process, the remaining peace process, which was with the Afghan side, um, rendering it uh, meaningless, as you as you said. One of the countries that seems to have known all along what was going on is Pakistan, and you've been scathing in your criticism of Islamabad over the years. In May, you said it had proved for 20 years that it could deceive the world and that it had always played a double game in Afghanistan. In your view, did Pakistan mastermind the Taliban takeover? I believe so. I, I believe there are uh, the one consistent aspect of the conflict in Afghanistan. And mind you, the, the, you know, when the, the thing that you call the Afghan conflict uh, not only in the last 20 years, but even before that, has always had these um, th three layers of, um, of, of, of factors, uh, the domestic factors, the regional factors, and the international factors. Um, but on, on um, Pakistan, what's, what's your evidence for saying they, they masterminded the takeover? Pakistan has always denied giving military assistance to the Taliban. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised we are having this, uh, discussing this question when even the Pakistanis today do not deny that. So it doesn't have to be, so the burden of proof is on them to just basically um, 
uh, uh, proved that th that that was uh, that was not the case. When uh, when it's it's completely evident that the Taliban leaders have lived there um, all along in the last 20 years. Their headquarters, their center of operations, has always been in Quetta. That the Taliban leaders, even to this day, they um, they're injured, uh, uh, have been taken there for for treatment. Um, but that's I, I think it's a bit too late to really discuss that and and. and Honestly, I don't know what uh, what benefit is there uh, to do that. It is it is what it is. We are where we are. The important thing is now to even even if Pakistan's role is completely uh, critical, uh, uh, maybe it's useful to engage them at this stage and see if if we can get a better solution in Afghanistan. Because the way things are going in Afghanistan may actually end up being completely detrimental to Pakistani security as well. It's just that some elements in Pakistan don't seem to, uh, to, to know this or even to care, care about it. Because in Pakistan as well, you know, Pakistan is controlled by, a, by, an, by an institution, by an overpowerful military. And I think it's really a lot of times it's the interest, the corporate interest of the military that trample the interest of the Pakistani people. Thanks for watching Conflict Zone on YouTube. If you enjoyed the show, please share it and follow the link to the playlist of previous interviews. Mr. Ludin, as far as the West is concerned, does NATO's withdrawal mean that it is no longer a player in the region, that it's pretty much lost all the leverage it had in Afghanistan and the wider area? I think significantly, yes. Uh, the, let's remember that for a long time, for the last 20 years, NATO uh, and uh, the United States in particular has, has had a, a, you know, the most important uh, leverage over events in Afghanistan, the direction of the things, the developments um, um, uh, 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 taking place. And, but today that, precisely for the reason that we discussed earlier, for the way that, that this whole transition or the withdrawal was conducted, um, that leverage is no longer there, and it's for two reasons. Uh, we and basically the evidence that we see. Number one, that the regional, or the region has has replaced that 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 influence. But you're uh, talking China. about Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan. Uh, correct, um, and and some other states as well. Like I mean, small states like Qatar, for example, today seem to have. Um, you know, significant influence, uh, even more so than um, if by influence we mean, you know, the, whatever the, the Taliban will actually listen to them. The other, the other evidence we see is the fact that the Taliban um, have, see absolutely no reason to um, to take seriously what uh, what the West is telling them, because they, for them, the relationship with the West is optional. They would prefer it. Um, they would really like the seat in the United uh, Nations in New York. Um, they would like to have the embassies and have the recognition. But it's easier um, to do business with Russia and China, isn't it? Because they're not going to impose any conditions like human rights, for instance, are they? So it's much precise. easier. It doesn't come. The aid, if it comes from China and Russia, won't have any strings attached to it, will it? Well, and even if the aid doesn't come, I don't think the Taliban really are. Uh, let's remember, for 20 years, they've, um, and, and even more so, even at the time when they were in power in the 90s, Taliban um, have been essentially a military machine, uh, um, consistently in conflict, and they have relatively little, if, if anything, uh, uh, of experience um, in terms of governing uh, the country. And, and in that kind of a situation, they've, they've really not yet um, developed uh, themselves into, into a political institution. And therefore, they don't seem to be amenable to public pressure, to, uh, to things like, you know, that's why, that's why using Sometimes the argument about using humanitarian aid or aid in general as a, you know, as a pressure on the Taliban, it, it kind of makes me makes me wonder that these, you know, not many people seem to understand the Taliban. For them, it probably is just it's an optional thing. If they have it, they they you know, they would be happy. If they don't have it, they would just consider it as a as the will of God. And they they really as a, as a as a deeply religious institution, they will just see the. It's, it's God's uh, will and, and God's responsibility to feed the poor people. Uh, Mr. Ludin, when you look at what defeated the Afghan army, you do have to mention the 
rampant corruption in the country that sapped people's loyalty and their will to fight. In, in 2009, according to Transparency International, out of 180 countries, only Somalia was listed as more corrupt than Afghanistan. Over the years, it hasn't been a proud record, has it, this corruption? Uh, no, sadly, it hasn't. Uh, and really, that, in a way, was a significant factor in the downfall of the, of the Islamic Republic, um, tragically. Um, I would also say add that though the the way that this whole thing has been been portrayed in the West is also incorrect. Um, imagine that a massive aid industry comes into play, um, billions of dollars flow into a, a totally impoverished country, a country that doesn't have the institutions of state to uh, to, to handle it. Um, I think corruption is the is the uh, the obvious uh, consequence. Um, but, but you but can't I think... lay all the blame at the U.S. door, can you? It's like a burglar breaking into a rich man's house and claiming it's the owner's fault for having so much money in the first place. I, I never do. I never blame the U.S. Um, at least, uh, you know, uh, significantly. I think I think it's the Afghans' fault. Um, I think we Afghans do tend sometimes to take far less responsibility than, than is due to us. Um, this was, after all, an opportunity, a totally, absolutely historic opportunity, unrepeatable in history for us to really make our country um, into a good, normal uh, society. And, and, and we failed. And corruption is, is one of the factors. Uh, but I think there were other factors as well. The factor, the, the leadership, the crisis of leadership that we had, our political elite did not really step up to the plate. And, and a good example was our just the runaway president that we had. If you've enjoyed this interview, please share your comments below and give it a like. You might also take a look back at my interview with the last Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani. Just click on the link. Well, you, you served the president before him, um, Hamid Karzai. Um, in 2010, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, Chatham House, accused Karzai's government of actively undermining the rule of law and accountability. Do you quarrel with that judgment? No, I don't. I, I served the, the, uh, the country uh, under his leadership. Um, I admire him still for a lot of qualities, for courage. Um, um, for the fact that he was a factor of unity and still is to this day. But, but I he don't... pardoned drug smugglers, didn't he? Rapists and Taliban commanders. You know, he neutered key anti-corruption bodies as well as watering down electoral monitoring after the polls had been marred by fraud. So there was a, a long list of things that he did to undermine the rule of law, wasn't there? I was going to come to that, yes. That, so there is the, uh, the you know, the, Corruption in a lot of the really the fundamentals of of of, of the building of state could have been uh, could have been done better under under his term, um, and we wouldn't be here today. So I think a significant part of the blame um, also goes to you know to those of us and and our, for for the little role that I had, I would be happy to. Uh, Accept that that we we probably didn't do a, a good job. Um, I would, however, just just point out that I don't think he cor he's corrupt personally. Um, I think he made an, an error of judgment by by basically putting uh, the need for unity at that time ahead of of, of reform and ahead of um, state building, which is the mistake that uh, the, the president after him repeated in exactly the opposite order because at a time when when unity was most needed he just went in and, um, and under false slogans of fighting corruption but the the fact is mr ludin hamid karzai turned the presidency into a kind of family cash cow didn't he at least six relatives were operating in or were linked to contracting businesses that collected millions of dollars from the americans and even his cousin mohammed Karzai, who lived in the U.S., pointed the finger at him and said, the Karzais over there in Afghanistan are cashing in on their last name. My relatives told me they can't understand why I don't come over with them and get rich. This was a kleptocracy, wasn't it? Let's give it its proper name. Um, well, first of all, I'm the, you know, the last time I, I, I worked in, in the the government under President Karzai was in 2000, was more than 10 years ago. Um, 
um, and I don't speak for him today, um, so it would be good that these questions are addressed to uh, somebody closer. But however, I do um, agree. I, I think I, I think the same was was done uh, sadly under the, the president that followed him. Um, uh, the, those family connections played played a huge role, which again, in a, in a society like Afghanistan, in the absence of strong institutions, I think that's probably what happens. These uh, you know tribal relationships, family relationships tend to um, tend to in, here in the West. You have um, you, you have uh, political parties that probably are the modern form of form of of, of tribe tribes that we have there in Afghanistan. Um, it is... It, it, There's not much it, comparison, though, is there? There's not much comparison. Let's be honest. Well, corruption takes place in every society. Yes, but, but, I think but it's, it's, it was the degree of it. It was the degree of it. I mean, politicians were, were building their poppy palaces. They were wheeling uh, suitcases with a million dollars in cash through the airport. Um, Karzai himself was receiving suitcases of cash from the CIA, wasn't he, on a regular basis? Wasn't he? Well, um, well, I, I did say that, uh, Tim, mm. that, that is a major factor in the downfall of the Republic, I started by saying this, is corruption. And those are just examples that you're mentioning, and I could even give you more. I'd like to look, at, if, if we may, at the way forward, because your, your think tank, the heart of Asia society, says the Taliban should continue to practice restraint from unilaterally establishing their emirate. They've also emphasized they'll accept a system that is inclusive. It's critical that the Taliban stand by these promises. We, we haven't seen much of restraint so far from the Taliban, have we? Targeted killings like the murder of a radio station manager in Kabul, the beating of UN staff, the looting of UN offices, shooting at uh, women and beating them at demonstrations in Kabul. There isn't much restraint there, is it? This, is, this isn't Taliban light, is it? Point of reference really is the Taliban in the 1990s. So if you compare it, and in, in many ways, they have behaved the same, in fact, even worse. Summary executions are continuing um, in areas captured by the Taliban, attacks against former and current government officials, as well as their family members. No restraint there, is there? Exactly. So, so the, the thing, one thing that has changed for the worse uh, since 90s is the fact that uh, today's Taliban are angry. They have a very deep-seated uh, vengeance that they will unleash, um, and, and they see there are examples that that has taken place. On the other hand, um, there was an opportunity, and the statements that you referred to from, from, from our organization was really um, uh, focused on the opportunities that, that, that there were, that we, we saw, and, and sadly we see le less of that now, and that was the fact that the Taliban refrained from declaring their, their, their Islamic Emirate at the beginning, that they engaged in some sort of negotiation, they reached out to some people. We saw that as an opportunity. I think those opportunities are increasingly um, you know, disappearing, and 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 I think that would be another historic mistake. Um, in one, that the Taliban did have an opportunity to really switch from a from a military focus into one of you know establishing a a, a good form of governance, uh, an inclusive form of governance. But it seems but they, that they, they when you when you're talking about establishing. Um, their future and uh, who they're going to deal with, they're dealing with Al-Qaeda, aren't they? Um, one of the, and, and its regional offshoots, who are busy celebrating what they call the defeat of America. Um, these are still close relationships, aren't they, between the Taliban and terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda. That's not going away, is it? Again, you have to see it in a, in a number of uh, ways. Uh, one is that the historic, there is an historic relationship between Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and you know why the 9-11 um, attack uh, that was planned from Afghanistan, uh, tragically at the time, and, and how the Taliban refused to hand over Osama bin Laden in the 90s, uh, or in the, the beginning of the, of, of the century, and that was why the, the, the intervention took place in Afghanistan. Today, where that stand, obviously Taliban have made some commitments and they know that there will be consequences to that um, uh, in terms of breaking away from, from Al-Qaeda. But, but let me just point out one clear thing. As far as I can I see it, extremist organizations throughout the region, not just in Afghanistan, are essentially part of the same 
this the same broad network whether it's al-qaeda whether it's uh, even even isis um uh, the islamic state today um, is i mean the taliban seem to be fighting them on the ground but i actually don't see them as being fundamentally um opposite uh and, but, Mr. Same... Mr. Ludin, but unless unless the Taliban breaks their ties with Al Qaeda, their promise not to host terrorist groups who are going to attack the West is worthless, isn't it? Well, the only way they could because that's what it, that's what Al Qaeda exists for. Exactly, and and that's the risk, and I think that's that's why you know one could be angry at the way that this whole thing was handled. We didn't have to. We go to be, to the beginning of our conversation. Um, it didn't have to be this way. It could have been done more responsibly for all its faults. We, we have been talking about the faults, the faults of the Islamic Republic. The Republic was the, the surest form of, of government that could, if helped, and, and if the Taliban had been included in it, and if, if the, the war had ended, um, strengthening the, 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 the state, uh, that would, would have been the surest way to, uh, to, uh, to, to sort of um, basically uh, ensure that Afghanistan would never be a, a place for, for radical elements in the future. All right. that, that certainty sadly does not exist and I can't, uh, I, I, I can't think of it. Can we talk briefly about the economy? The, the people's needs are huge and urgent. About 15 million Afghans are now reported to be living below the poverty line. From what you said earlier, the Taliban don't seem to care. God will look after, God will dispense, God will provide if, if he feels like doing that. Um, we now know that the new acting head of the central bank has no formal financial training or higher education, Haji Mohammed Idris. Sounds like a disaster in the making. Do you, do you think that they have learned anything about running an economy uh, in the last 20 years? The Taliban could still control security institutions and, and, and show to their people, to their rank and file, that they have still hold, hold power. But they should have included technical elements. They should have included uh, technocrats. They should have included um, not necessarily people like myself as with any association with the former government. Uh, with the former government. They could have just brought totally new faces and that would have given people more confidence and trust. They could have given the world more confidence and trust. But I think increasingly, as I said, increasingly I'm seeing that the Taliban are about to lose this opportunity once again. Do you think the, the resistance will continue, resistance that we've seen on the streets, particularly from women, protest groups in, in Kabul itself? That's where, that's where the change is. I think that's where the, the, you know, the real republic is on the streets of Kabul. Um, and that will, uh, you know, once again, if, if it hasn't already um, rang bills, uh, bills in, the, in, in, in the Taliban's minds, then it should. Because governing Afghanistan today will not be easy. Uh, the 1990s was a completely different time. Resistance will absolutely continue. That uh, I, I think that is why um, it's a it's a I see it as a, as a, as a total mistake, and it would be short lived if um, if the Taliban do not um, really sort of encapsulate the the, the, the new society. But, um, but at the end of the day, can, can any of the gains of the last 20 years survive? I'm talking about the education of girls and women, the three and a half million girls who went to school. 27% of MPs were women. Life expectancy for women actually went up by 10 years. It, will any of that survive? Certainly not the po po political participation of women from all accounts. Uh, it could once again, as I said, I still, even though I am worried and I sound worried, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure um, um, about the fact that though that that opportunity is slipping. But, but if the Taliban insist on on just being as pure and monolithic in terms of their governance as as it seems today, then then it would be very hard for them to govern. It would be very hard for them to ensure because radical elements are increasingly even we're seeing it in the last two three weeks. The, there was one there was, there was one kind of a, a Taliban presence on the street. Today it's a, it's a different uh, kind. Um, so there would be my the fear is that when you when you do not provide that sort of big cover of of of, of sort of leniency inclusivity. 
and an intention to sustain the, the gains and protect them, then what happens is below people just then compete on being more radical than the others. And then, and then that will then translate into policies being, being changed. Uh, there are commitments, of course, the Taliban have made on, 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 on women's rights, on protecting some of the gains. Um, but you, don't but how, place, you won't place much value on that. Well, they are shooting themselves in the foot. It wouldn't have changed them uh, in any way. They, they, they w wouldn't have been a threat to their, uh, to their rule if they had allowed uh, those things, if they had made it very clear that that's what their priority is and, and that today's Afghanistan has changed and they will not be the Taliban of the 1990s. They're saying that in, in words, but we, have see, we need to see that in action. And we haven't seen uh, in the last few weeks uh, a lot of that in action. So I worry for the gains to be lost. But at the same time, I think um, I think the, Af the the people this time will will fight. The people will not just let it go like like the 1990s. Jawed Luden, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Thank you very much for being with us on Conflict Zone. You're most welcome, uh, Mr. Sebastian. Good to talk to you.